thank you that we could worship you in song. Thank you that you've given us this gift to worship you. Lord, I pray now as we open your word that you would clear our minds, the things that have been bugging us through this week, the things that are distracting us, clear our minds and open our hearts that we would receive your word, the word you have for us, each of us this morning. And so bless our time together as we continue now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shante, when you go out, will you close that door? Thank you. Uh, church keeps changing. Every week we have something different. And so I'm preaching from this side this morning. Can I come down a bit, Sean? I'm talking to myself. So let's, let's jump into, I, I can't remember if I gave you chocolates last week. I did. So who can remember what I preached on last week? Don't say joy. That's not good enough. How many points? Remember, we're breaking Baptist tradition. We went from seven to five. Today I have none. Five points to know that I can have joy. Five points of why I can have joy. Salvation. Salvation. Tony, if you shout again, you're not getting a chocolate. You know the rules. <laughs> Sorry? Just joyful. Two more. Confidence in Christ. Should I make it more difficult for her? the other two points that come with it? <laughs> so I can have confidence in Christ. Why? Hopefully I can remember them. If I'm going to have confidence in Christ, I must believe the gospel. And I must know what Jesus is doing in my life if you go and read that scripture. And one more. There's three left. My changed nature. I have confidence because Christ changes my nature. As I'm growing, he makes me more and more like him. I also have a future in Christ. And I think there was one more. The future with Christ, yes. Change nature and joy. So, well done if you're listening. We're moving on this morning. I just want to say to you, there was a problem last week with joy being recorded. So if you haven't found it on our website, you're not on the wrong website. I'm going to redo that on Tuesday in my office. Anton's going to come and film it again sitting at my desk. And then we will put it up again probably by Wednesday morning. It should be up again. So you'll be able to get the full series. So we have realized there is a problem. So it be a slightly different context, but you will get it up on by Wednesday we should have it for you so today is going to be slightly different as we run through what I've got for you it's those kind of sermons that like just comes but you don't quite know how to put it into action so that's that's what you're getting this morning so as I was reading this week and thinking around love what does it really mean for us I picked up these words now the older folk will know this most of our young adults are away at the moment but who can remember this Love, love, love. All you need is love. Love is all you need. Who can remember that? Who wrote it? John Lennon. Yes, I haven't got a chocolate for you. John Lennon wrote that, and eventually in 1967, the year I was born, it became a hit. Love, love, love. All you need is love. Sadly, that's not quite true. Because... Just saying all you need in love is a little bit impractical because love actually doesn't really work like that. I think I can love my children and I do. I can love my children to the ends of the earth and back. But if that's all I do, there's a problem. I've got to put that love into action. I've got to love them in action, otherwise they're going to starve to death. Yeah, are oh, you such a good little boy? But he's busy getting thinner and thinner because I'm not feeding him. I've got to love him in action. I can love my wife with all my heart, but I can guarantee if I don't put it into action, soon she's going to get rid of me. And you can work that out however your context is. <laughs> but eventually it's not going to work anymore because just to say just love is all you need is not a practical or realistic thing. And so we get to this, this love now. We've already had hope promised. I should give you chocolates for this. Hope promised, peace Given, joy, I can hear it whispered, expected. And now we have hope 
revealed. Sorry, not hope, love revealed. What we're gonna celebrate next Sunday is, is love actually revealed to us. And I wanna say to you, you cannot have hope, peace, or joy without love. The, the central theme that runs through every one of those is love, and it's the love of God for us. Without Jesus' love, without God revealing his love through Jesus, we can never have hope, joy, or peace or fully understand what love is. And so that's what we're gonna be touching on this morning. And I also try to think through, what does it look like? But love is quite abstract. If you watch those little kids, try and say, well, what is love? Well, my mommy and daddy love me and that. But to actually try and put it into some kind of wording is actually very, very difficult because it needs the physical action to go with that. As I had last week, I said to you, joy is not a what? A feeling, it feels like a bit of a lecture today. Joy is not a feeling, joy is a mindset. Because life isn't always gonna be good, it's not always gonna be easy. But joy then is a mindset of how I go through my life, being united with Christ, my future change, all those kind of things. So what happens with love then? And I did test this on, on two very experienced pastors to see that they agreed with me, Sue and Kathy. So if you're not happy with what it is, talk to them. But I said to them, do you agree with me? Love is not just an emotion. Love is a conscious choice. Love is not just an emotion. Love is a conscious choice that we have to make. How many times have I shared with you, and I will share this with some of our couples that are, are getting ready to get married now, that kind of falling in love kind of deep emotional thing doesn't last very long. St statistics say about two years into your marriage, all those butterflies are dead. All those things that made you really feel all excited about your partner are gone. Then the choice starts of how much work am I gonna put into this relationship? That's the choice of love in action. No longer the emotional thing. Now it's a conscious choice. This is the person I've married. This is how I'm going to love her or him. Conscious choice, active choice. Imagine if God just sent us this book and it was a lot thinner than this and all he said was, I really, really do love you. And that was it. Would we fully understand love? I don't think so. See, he had to say to us, I really, really do love you, but let me show you how. And here's the greatest example is God to us to say, if you're going to love as God loves, then this is how it works. It's not just in words. It's not just in thought. It's actually in getting our hands dirty in the love because love is messy. If any of you have just been in love your whole lives and it's been hunky-dory, butterflies, all that, you need to come and talk to me because it's just unrealistic. It's something we have to really, really work on. I'm so glad that our, our speaker this morning who sat in his chair, Dave, there is gonna be a chair rapture and this is the only chair worthy. So if it's gone, it's going to my house. So now nice sitting in the morning having a cup of coffee when none of you are here yet, just sitting in there having a cup of coffee. Just. But John, John, Dave read this. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I had a look at the message Bible. It says, my dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. Let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. And so that's what we're gonna to touch on this morning. As we look through scripture, how does this work itself out? How does God reveal that to us? Because right through scripture from Genesis 1, in the beginning, now I'm gonna test your Bible knowledge, in the beginning to Revelation 22 verse 21. Can anyone know what that is? Not amen, no, that's the end of the verse. Sorry. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus be with his people. Amen. So right from in the beginning to amen is the story woven through scripture of God practically showing you and me what it means to love somebody. How we work that out in our everyday lives. How do we love people? The first picture I see of it is when it says in the beginning God created. That was his love for us, creating us, bringing us into being. And then having this incredible relationship with, with his first creation with Adam and Eve walking with them, talking with them, being in perfect harmony with them. And then we know what happens in Genesis 3. Sin enters the world, 
Eve is deceived, Adam sins, Adam doesn't stand up for what he should be doing, he doesn't say to his wife, you're out of line, problem. Sin steps in and everything goes wrong. Then we see this incredible, for me, an incredible truth that there can never or cannot be love. Are you listening to me? There cannot be love without wrath. There cannot be love, true love, without wrath. There cannot be hope without hopelessness. There cannot be joy without chaos. There cannot be peace without unpeace. That's a nice new word. Turmoil, thank you. Pens go back there. I said to Pens, he can't sit here because he always sits this side and I know where he's gonna chirp from. But there cannot be the one without the other. Because the one is the, the antithesis of the other. So if you're gonna have love, then there must be wrath. For us to fully understand the fullness of God's love, we must know that there's a God of wrath as well who punishes sin. Otherwise, what's the point of loving us if there was no uh, challenge for our sin? And right from the beginning, we mustn't ever think that God is not a God of wrath. Because we see from the start when he, when he dealt with the sinful people, that, that passage where he says to them, destroy the Canaanites, every single one of them, wipe them out. The God of wrath. We see the sin of Achan in the book of Joshua. Achan steals a little bit of stuff that he shouldn't. And what does God do? He wipes them out. It says, Achan came, his wife, his children, his donkeys, his cattle, his sheep, his servants, his tent, everything. And they were stoned. They began with Achan and they stoned him. And then they stoned his wife, his children, his servants, and everything that he owned. The wrath of God manifested. We have to keep that in our minds that God is a God of wrath. And this anger became, came out right at the flood, Genesis chapter 6, where God wiped out everything. Everything. But even in that wiping out is this love shown to this family that he rescues and bring out, brings out of the flood and says, I will look after you and I will guard you. And then his journey goes on as he builds his people again and he says to them, I'll take you out of Egypt. I'll take you out of slavery. You've been disobedient, but I will rescue you and I will bring you into the promised land. He takes them to the Jordan. He helps them get across the Jordan. And the, what's the first thing that happens on the other side? They see this huge city called Jericho and it's in their way. I, I probably thought, why don't you just go around it? Yeah, just go down the Jordan a little bit, cross over somewhere else and then miss Jericho. But God had a plan, you see, because in Jericho, there was something we needed to see. And so they do all this fancy stuff around the city of blowing trumpets and walking round and round and round. But in the middle, and we've touched on this before, is this lady by the name of Rahab. And Rahab was a, a woman, we can use the word ill repute. There's another word that I have that's a lot harsher, but I don't think we should use it in the church because there's little people around. She was a prostitute. That's a nice, nice word even. She was unclean, unwanted, untouchable, disregarded, rejected by every single one. What I find really, really strange with this woman is the very men that rejected her used her at night. Absolute disgrace what was going on in the city. But there's this one woman out of all of these people who sees God is coming. She doesn't know who he is. She just knows that something happened to Og and something happened to Sion and he's coming here next. And we better get ourselves right. And she's the only one that looks to this and says, I need to get myself right with God and says to the spies, if your God will, can he please rescue me? It's my words. But she recognizes even in the power of that God and the wrath of that God, there's something in this God that will save her and that will rescue her. And what do they say to her? We all got one of these this morning. I haven't given it to you so you can put it around your wrist and become a little bit Hinduish. I want you to put it in your Bible. In the place of 1 John 3 verse 18. Let us not love with words or speech or the tongue only, but let us love with truth and action. That every time you pick up your Bible, this thing reminds you that love is not just an emotion, it's an action you have to take. And the spies say to her, just hang this out of your window. Just put it on the window so when the armies come, we will see this and we will rescue you and whoever else you have saved 
everyone else, your family, whoever you, put them in your house. Whoever's outside is going to be wiped out. Does it sound familiar? It's even during the Passover, there was the same thing. This picture of this scarlet thread. Wipe the blood of an innocent lamb on the doorposts of your house. And when the angel of death passes over, whoever's inside will be rescued. God's love in action. His wrath is being poured out. But in the center of that wrath is this scarlet thread. And this thread runs from in the beginning to amen. Right through is God's love in action for you and me. Right from the prophets. The prophets, how many times do we read the major and the minor prophets all with the same message? You better get your act together. And I, start here, I could start with Donna and Steve and with Vessi and with Melanie and with Zoe and I could go down to you one at a time right through the whole church and say to you, God is saying to you through his word, get your act together. Get your act together because I'm coming. Get your act together, Barry, Louise. Get your act together, I'm coming. But built into every one of those prophetic words is get your act together. But I have a plan. I have a plan of love. I have a plan to rescue you. I have a plan to bring you out of those things. And we see it. Sean shared it with us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And God did not send his son to condemn the world but to save his people. Even in that very thing of Jesus coming is this picture of God's love for you and me. Are we getting our acts together as we look at this Christmas time? As we consider this baby born, let's move on from baby born to Christ sacrificed to risen king. He's coming. And the thread has been woven through us this morning. And when we look at the cross and we look at Jesus, he's gonna come through and have you got one of these? Now I'm not saying, please don't think that if you have one of these, Jesus is gonna save you. Nothing fancy in this piece of string. But symbolically, if you don't have the scarlet thread of Jesus Christ in your life, you're gonna pay the price. Because God's love is centered around your and my faith in his love for us, shown to us in Christ. That's what he did for us. That absolute love in the middle of all that wrath. God's love. And I I look then, as I think through the Old Testament, going into the New Testament, we have these two sets of people, one of love and one of the antithesis of love. One, if you're writing two columns, you can have Jesus this side, and this side you can have the Pharisees, God's supposed teachers, God's people that he sent. And all they were about was the first part of 1 John 3, 18, where he says, let us not love people with speech or our tongue. And that's where the Pharisees found themselves. And unfortunately, they didn't love with their tongues either. The Pharisees used God's word, God's law, for control and for manipulation and for rejection and for rebellion and for manipulation. And they condemned the people by the law. That wasn't what God wanted. God sent his law in one way to keep us safe, but also to reveal the fact that we need Jesus. And the Pharisees, all they wanted to do was live by the law because then they could suppress people. If if you have a chance, there's a show on Netflix we've just watched that was recommended to us by Sue. And and if you know me well, I'll confess, I don't watch many Christian movies because I just find them the way they portray Jesus and that, it's just, no. But we've just watched this, an eight-part series, season one. And there you see these Pharisees, how they live by the law to condemn and control and keep people under their thumb. But here comes Jesus. And the second part of 1 John 3 verse 18 comes into play. But love people by action and in the truth. How do we see that in Jesus? Well, we see that in the cross. As he goes to the cross, in the truth, we see this fact that there must be the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sin. Without shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Jesus comes as the truth. The one and only truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The truth of Christ, the truth of God's word. God becoming flesh, dwelling amongst us. 1 John 1. That is the truth. And so God was already, even in his law, he was revealing that the truth is coming in Jesus. 
Do we believe that? Do we accept that? If you look at last week, joy, do you believe the gospel? Without the gospel, there cannot be hope, joy, peace, or love. And without the gospel, there cannot be salvation. That's the truth coming. But then is this ultimate picture of God's love in action being revealed to us. Love people, not just with your tongues, but with what you do. And Jesus comes under God's, God's command and, and he goes to the cross for you and I and he hangs there as a picture for you and I to say, this is how you love people. This is how you love your fellow man, whether they are Christians or not, rich or poor. So I might go off for a while. Just listen carefully. No matter who we are, God is saying to us, on the cross, I died for all people. I want you to love all people in exactly the same way. Look at it. That's why I'm standing behind it this morning. So this becomes the focus of what is going on. This is God's love in action. Bloodshed, body given for us. Can we love like that? Do we love like that? It's not just a soft, touchy feeling. It's a choice I have to make. When guys come to the door, I was busy yesterday and I was hot and the sweat was running in my eyes and somebody shouted at my gate and he said, I'm hungry. I'm busy. But it was like God said to me, you're preaching tomorrow on loving action and you can't give a man something to eat. It's just, we've got to get this conscious choice in our minds. God is calling us to step out of our comfort zone and love people. And it's a, I'll tell you what, it's a challenge for me. I'll be open and honest with you. There are times when I just don't want to love people. Because the choice you made has put you in that position. Now you want me to love you out of it. You got yourself in it. Put your big boy pants on. Move on. But we call in every situation through the picture of the cross of Calvary and through the birth of a baby, love people like this. Love people, even to the detriment of my own well-being, love people. And I just flick through my Bible, just to some stories. This is man, Bartimaeus, he's sitting on the side of the road, dirty, unclean, smelly, Jesus is coming along. And he shouts to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My words again, you can go and read it in Mark. And his friends are saying to him, Friend, shh, be quiet. This man will never look at you. This man will never speak to you. You're stinky and smelly and you're stuck down on the ground. Stay where you are. And Jesus says, who is that? Who is that? And he says, come to me. Now I have these words. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And he says, I want to see and he says to your faith is healed with God. And the man can see. What an incredible picture of Jesus loving. In that time, he wouldn't have been allowed to go near that man. But he goes, he steps out. And from there we see them moving on. They cross the Sea of Galilee. This guy comes running down. He start naked. And he runs to Jesus. Everybody's terrified because it's the demoniac of Gadara. And Jesus says to him, who are you? And they, he says, I am legion. Six to seven thousand demons. And it's very similar. What do you want? And he's healed and sent on his way. Jesus stepping into a place where none of us would ever want to go. We see him healing lepers. There's such an incredible picture in this the series, The Chosen, where this leper comes. He's kicked out of a shop. But he comes to Jesus and all his disciples all covering their faces and saying, Jesus, don't touch him. Don't go near him. He's a leper. And there's this picture of Jesus walking up to him and putting his hand onto him. See, at that time, even to breathe the air would have killed you or would have got, you would have got leprosy. But to touch a leper, you're virtually signing your own death warrant, your own exclusion from society. Jesus touches him and he's healed. And his life is restored. The love of God in action, out of the ordinary, touching their lives. Man comes to Jesus and says, my daughter is dying. It's too late, your daughter's dead. You know his name? Jairus. Jesus says, well, let's go and have a look. Jesus is on his way. In that very time while he's walking, a woman touches the hem of his garment. He says, who touched me? Even unconsciously, his love is working. 
This woman is healed. After 12 years of bleeding, she's restored. He gets to Jairus' house. The daughter's dead. What does he say to her? Talita, Talita Kaum. Girl, get up and eat. Out of dead body. Shouldn't be anywhere near a dead body. Shouldn't be near a woman who's been unclean and bleeding for 12 years. Spiritually or ceremonially unclean. Jesus' love in action. Maybe my challenge to ask you this week is, what happened in this week for you? In your business, in your family, in your, where, at the robot, wherever, were you love in action as a Christian, as a Jesus disciple? Or did that person say, oh, that person, I don't know, because we just chased them. Are we being love in action? The last story I want to just share with you. There's a, a book in the Bible called Hosea. And that book is the ultimate picture of God's love for us. Do yourself a favor, go and read it again. And we see God calling this man, Hosea, to marry a prostitute. I mean, Lord, please, I'll do anything for you, but not that. I want you to do that. And you're going to live with her, and she's going to break your heart. She's going to break your heart, but you have to love her. I don't even know how Hosea felt. He marries this woman and she leaves him and she goes back to her job. And I would have said, that's you. God says to him, go and fetch her. Go and fetch her and bring her back. God in action in the worst of situations working for us. This table for us is this full reflection of God's love in action for us. Isn't it time for us to stop just saying, I love you, and actually being active in how we love people? Maybe, maybe you've got to go home to your husband or your wife or your family and say, maybe we need to talk about some things. Because what I'm doing to you, what I'm showing you, is not love in action. Am I able to fully understand God's love? And again this morning, if the gospel is not real to you, if salvation is not part of your life, then true love will never be revealed. You'll never understand it. It's only when you fully understand the wrath of God and the fact that I'm going to hell if I don't know Him that I will know the truth. And so we're going to share around this table this morning a reminder of a, for us of how much God truly loves us. What I'm going to do too is there's four, four of these so I'm going to ask eight people who would like to serve communion to the rest of us. You'll be welcome to come and join me when I call you. Anybody, and maybe what I'm going to do is say, if you have never, ever had the privilege, because this is a privilege, never, ever had the privilege of serving communion, then you will be welcome to join me. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took a piece of bread with his friends, and he said to them, this is my body which is given for you. And after he'd taken the bread and done that, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he gave thanks for it. And he said to them, this is my blood shed for you. This is the new covenant. This is the forgiveness of sin. This is the ultimate picture of love for us. How many of us would give our blood for people who don't like us, people who don't love us, people who reject us, people who deny us, people who call us names? said this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins this is my new promise I've brought you salvation and freedom let me pray for us then I will call you up Lord thank you thank you for your love for us Lord thank you that you didn't just speak about love but you showed love you revealed your heart for your people by giving your own son as a sacrifice your own son as a spotless sacrifice without blemish no deceit ever found on his lips. You gave him for us deceitful, lying, broken promises, unfaithful people. Yet your loving action revealed your heart. And so as we share this bread and we drink of this cup together, I pray for each of us that you would again open our spiritual eyes to see you afresh, to recognize the cross to recognize, yes, a manger. 
to get again that, that excitement in our very spirits as the, the shepherds had. As they heard that message, bring that back to us. That we would be excited again about you. Let us as a church, as your family, not leave this morning unchanged by your word. Lord, thank you that your love is steadfast. That your love is overshadowing. That your love is perfect. That your love is eternal. That your love is is redemptive. And so Lord, as we look at this table, it's not, not just something we do, but it's a reminder to us of your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to, to share, young or old, you're welcome just to stand with me and to share communion. Don't all rush. Otherwise, I'm just going to pick on people. Maybe we'll, we'll just take four. Or they, they keep, if they keep coming, just share with somebody. If you'll stand with quakes. We can move around and serve. Friends, we're just a family. Let's just enjoy our time of fellowship together. Please, you can eat your bread when you're ready. Let's drink together as we remember. I just want to say, before we drink this, as you drink this, remember that next week, Sunday, we begin the celebration. Sorry, I didn't realize you were still at the back. As you drink of this, remember that next week we celebrate, and then we're heading towards Easter, all of it showing, for me, this hope promised, peace given, joy expected, ultimately wrapped up in this love revealed. Let's drink together. Lord, we thank you again for your grace to us. And Lord, may I just end with the words of John this morning. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. Lord, thank you that we remain in your love. May your grace abound in us. May your love cover us. And the fellowship of your Holy Spirit guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.